Oh, no, it does? I just put you in my uh, earbud. You can't hear me well? Oh, okay, okay, because it's so much easier for me to hear.
Hi there. And good day. Today is Friday, March 20th. And this is the third episode of our daily drawing party. I've been having a lot of fun doing these things. I hope you have too. So this is uh, an ever evolving uh, experiment. And um, it's so nice to be joined by lots of different people. I see a lot of people here um, on YouTube. And uh, let's see who's here. Maria and Dana. Iris the flower in Belgium. How nice. Uh, a different Iris, Iris Goldfarb in Massachusetts. And another flower-related item, uh, Thistle You Know Who. Uh, is, a, is a regular uh, on the um, draw with me. And Alice, Karen, Nancy, John Cromer, Andrea, and uh, Tracy and Karen. So thanks all of you for joining me today. Um, today's going to be yet another type of drawing experiment. And, you know, what I'm always thinking about is what are ways that we can use drawing as, um, as a way of having fun, as a way of, of feeling calm, of getting perspective, um, of learning, of spending time, spending time together also. Uh, I think that that's something that we all crave, some uh, opportunities to hang out with people who share our interests and, uh, and our passion for drawing. So, you know, drawing has always been really important to me, not only as a, as a creative endeavor, not only as a way of, of developing my creative skills, my drawing skills, but also as a way of engaging with my life. You know, um, I started to draw, boy, it's almost uh, 20, 25 years ago. So I was a grown man and I uh, hadn't drawn in a really long time. And I had some uh, massive changes in my life. And um, I was looking for a way to gain perspective on those changes. And I was looking really for meaning. I was looking for perspective. And then I found that drawing was um, was the solution for me. Drawing was a way of, of gaining um, calm and gaining perspective and gaining um, a sense of the beauty in my life. So it was really important and, and it became something that was kind of a fun hobby. And then it became really an obsession and uh, eventually it became really my entire life my whole life has become devoted to drawing and and encouraging other people to draw and so um you know when we encounter something like we're encountering today in the world we can use drawing to to get a grip in a way so anyway thanks all for joining me i he, i see temina zishan from Pakistan. You know, I uh, have a long connection with Pakistan. My mother was born there. My mother, in fact, was just in Lahore just a couple weeks ago. She came back just uh, as the world started to change. So I have a strong connection and love for Pakistan. Um, yes, and uh, Kristen in rainy Pittsburgh. It's beautiful here in, in Phoenix today. It is sunny. In fact, we had to drape some stuff across the windows because it was glaringly bright in here. So, but let me tell you um, a bit about what we're going to do today. We're going to, draw, we're going to work on drawing portraits. Okay. We're all in, uh, in situations where hopefully there's at least one other person with you. If not, there's at least a mirror. And this is a great opportunity to spend some time drawing from life, you know, and uh, just draw the other person who's with you sitting around doing whatever they're doing. Um, you know, we can we can keep making a record of what's going on around us and, and keep um, doing it through perhaps portraiture, drawing the person who you're with 
uh, and capturing their different moods and different reactions um, in your sketchbook and maybe using that as a way of cataloging your days. So today what I want to do is I want to share uh, one of the videos from the Sketchbook School archive of lessons. You know, we have lots and lots of courses which have lots and lots of lessons. And this particular lesson is from a course that we did recently that I really love. It's called People Drawing People. And we brought in, um, I think it was six or seven different really amazing artists and asked them to draw portraits, to draw people, uh, their full bodies, to draw people um, in foreshortened, so like lying down, to draw people in motion, and to draw self-portraits, all these different ways of drawing people. And we use them as, um, as ways of, of comparing and contrasting the different approaches that artists have to drawing and also learning how to draw like they do and discussing it. So it was a, it was a really fun course. And I want to show you um, one of the videos today from that course. And it features France Van Stone, who is an old pal of mine, who's a, a great artist. Um, you may know her from, from Instagram. You may know her from her brilliant book called Sketch. Uh, or you may know her from Sketchbook School because she's taught for us before. But this is um, France. Uh, so we're going to watch this video. And then when it's over, we have a really special treat, which is France is going to join us live. And we're going to talk about drawing and cross-hatching and so forth. So if you're looking for something to draw, if you don't have a person around you, you can draw me. You can draw France as we talk. Um, and uh, let's get to it. So here we're going to begin with this video from, again, People Drawing People. It's a course you can sign up for at Sketchbook School if you're looking to go more in depth on this subject. Um, here is France. So when I started drawing like this, um, what I always want to make sure I get somewhat right, right off the bat, is uh, the proportions. And you know, with a pen, anything can happen, and that's okay. Um, but what I'm going to do right now is rough lines of where I'm going, even if I don't really see them myself. It doesn't matter. I just want to get a feel for the proportions of the face of my subject. There's a nostril here. Things are going to get a little more details, detailed soon, but at first I want to get a feel for where, for example, this jaw uh, is situated compared to where the nose here ends, for instance. Um, there's an ear there somewhere, but there's going to be hair on top. So as I am drawing uh, Arthur, my model, here, I want to make sure that uh, your proportions are kept somewhat right. As I'm doing this in pen, so anything can happen. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of hair involved in this, uh, in this portrait, which is great. This has never been a problem, hair and facial hair. Um, I've already done some rough lines for um, proportion so that I don't lose track, but now I'm going to go darker into the details of uh, your hair, your eyes, and uh, try not to get too caught up in the details at first. And try to somewhat stay true to your features as I'm doing this. <clears throat> okay. There's a little bit of your uh, right eyelid that's going to show on the other side of your nose, but it's barely a suggestion of it. Again, um, I'm going very light on my pen here because I'm not committing uh, completely to my very first lines you will see me gradually go darker and darker as I decide that those are the lines I want to keep. You don't have the luxury to erase or go back, so I go lightly at first. Mouth, lip, chin, darker here. And I think my proportions are okay, so all I have to do now is make sure that 
the head itself looks okay. Big, big mistake that we tend to do here is not do the right shape of the head. You have to constantly think that there's a skull in there, and this is how I think. Whenever I draw a head, I cannot lose track of the fact that there is a skull. The ear sits kind of in the middle, and that's how I proceed. And it's funny, it's like that when you draw uh, someone, obviously, with clothes on. There's anatomy underneath that you can't deny, that you have to take into account. And that kind of dictates how you draw everything. See, even here, I can, I can go a little further. The hair is long. Facial hair here. So I do a lot of cross-hatching, but I'm not going to go too crazy into the details. I want to suggest the dark areas. Here's one. This is always dark here in this little nook. Okay. There's a little bit of dark here. But mostly, now I want to identify where it is that I see the darker areas on Arthur's face. And that's where I add a little bit of shading. Here too. And now I'm going a little darker with my pen. And adding wherever I see dark, that's where I add strokes. There you go, right there. Little facial hair here. So you see how I went from um, being a little tentative with my strokes at first to now feeling far more confident in my proportions and now adding uh, where the dark is. Three minutes left. Neglect the fact that there is a, a neck and more hair coming this way. Okay. So here in a few minutes, we don't really have time to get into great detail, but at least we have the essential features of our model. And that's really all I want to convey here today. Adding a little bit of dark where I feel confident that it fits. Coming back and adding more darkness. Suggesting the dark hair with just a few dark strokes here. Very basic. So you see, really, there are two things that I 
I worried about my proportions at first and respecting the fact that there is a human skull behind all this, underneath all this, I should say, and um, the dark areas, the things that make the drawing not look so flat, but a little more uh, 3D, a little more interesting. And really, that's about it. I'm going to add a little bit of darkness under his jaw, always keeping in mind where you see the dark areas on your model and show that. She is live. The actual, <laughs> the actual France Van Stone. Fantastic. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Do you remember making that video when you drew Artur's yes. portraits? Yes. Yeah. So that was uh, that was last winter. In uh, yeah, it was, it was cold and snowy. And, it was. Uh, it seems like a million years ago, doesn't it? Yeah, back when we could still all be in in the same room together. That's true. That's true. And now here we are. Well, we're virtually in the same room. We're in the same screen, at least. So how are you doing? How are things going? Now, you, you are a, you're a, um, a school teacher, so obviously that is complicating your situation as well. Tell us about what you're up to. It is, but I'm, uh, you know, fortunately being a teacher, I'm still working, but from home. Um, and we've, we've developed, we have amazing leadership at my school district. I'm, I'm really fortunate. People who have been on the ball way before it was even an idea in other school districts, you know, mine to, to close schools. So uh, we got prepared for this uh, over the past few weeks and uh, we teach remotely. We basically, you know, video, we do a lot of uh, what we call choice boards and uh, flip grids and things that uh, maybe other public education teachers, uh, maybe who are watching us today know. Yeah, Google has kind of saved the day there in a lot of ways. It's, if this had happened in 1998, I don't know what we would have been doing. We wouldn't have been talking on Skype. Nope. No, it would have nope. been, and information would not have been as readily available. I mean, yes, it's, it would have been a very different situation. So you teach yeah. French, so you're able to presumably do that um, uh, yeah. This way. Now, what about drawing? What role is drawing playing in your days these these days? Um, funny enough, since this has started, it has really slowed down my my drawing because now that I work from home, there is less of that. You know, uh, that waterproof. Well, it's never really waterproof when you're a teacher, but you know, a frontier like border between work and home. So everything's happening at home. So I find myself stretching uh, school activities until the wee hours of the night. And last wow. night it was about 10.30 when I realized, oh, hey, I haven't drawn today. Hmm. So I ended up doing a drawing like in the late hours of the night, which is fine. But it's strange how things now are just not as well-defined, you know, and, and it does affect my ability to, to set aside time to, okay, now I can draw. You know. So how do you, how do you normally fit drawing into your life on a, on a regular basis? What what do you, how, how often do you draw? Like how long do you draw for, etc.? I try every day, um, and it yeah, it's usually every day. And no, I, I can't always put in an hour. Uh, sometimes it has to be a half hour, but or less. But for me, it's definitely an evening um, an evening activity. You know, when I put everything behind, when I force myself to put down the schoolwork because otherwise I could be grading until again, until I fall asleep, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's usually an evening thing for me. I rarely, rarely sketch in daylight. Really? Yeah. What a shame. And what a shame that this is an opportunity for you to do it too. Well, hopefully things will calm down and you'll have some more free time because 
Yeah, well, sure. I'll just organize my life differently. You know, I can I can also figure things out so that I can do drawing maybe block two hours in the in the daylight. I just haven't figured it out yet. You know. So I think watching you draw, and I've seen you draw many times, and I've filmed you drawing mm -hmm. many times, and I feel yes. like it's it is such a, uh, a a calming, interesting experience because I think like what you describe in that particular video from people drawing people is this kind of development of the drawing where it begins with this sort of uh, figuring out the proportions and drawing very lightly, you know, to mm -hmm. just kind of to block it out. And then you sort of move on to talking about the whole head so that you have, you know, that you're capturing the back of the skull and you're making sure that the entire head is there. Because so often we do have that problem where you, you draw the features yes. and then, right, and then suddenly you have, uh, yes. you know, uh, a, a weird crushed back of the head. <laughs> right. we've, all, we've all made that mistake. Or you, or you have no forehead, you know. Right, um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely uh, a trick. And then you... You spend a lot of time building up the the contrast and building up light. I've just described what you do, but why don't you describe it in more detail? And tell us <laughs> about what your process is. Um, no, it's true. I think that for me, in order to to feel somewhat successful in you know in the building of a drawing, I have to establish my proportions first, even if I do it with a pen, obviously, and I don't start in pencil necessarily. But um, doing that first, and maybe you will agree with this, Danny, that this is very much the work of, of a sculptor almost. You know, you were talking about the volume of the head, but it's really what it is. Even as you lay down your first proportions, you already have to think of what kind of volume am I, am I dealing with here, especially for a head. I'm dealing with something that is round, that has volume in the back, volume in the front that has a certain... And so basically this determines my, you know, my first lines and then the building of whatever is going to determine whether something is exposed to light as opposed to not is also a very 3D kind of work because I build, you know, the, the cross hatching according to the curves of the face. Right. And of course, your light source is going to dictate um, the dimensions, yeah. but also... When you're doing working in cross hatching, you're really adding detail in the shadows, right? Because the the highlights. Right. I mean, I'm looking at your face right now, where your face is very right. lit, you can barely see anything. And then mm -hmm. what we want to do with cross hatching is we want to continue to layer and 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 um, build up the lines so that you get a sense of three dimensionality. And so you have to think about that from the beginning. You're right. You have to think. Okay, I don't want to put even in my lightest sketch. I don't want to have too much here because I can't take it away. Oh yeah, well, especially when you uh, start in uh, in pen. So if I were uh, to draw myself right now, I would I would think that this side of my face would have a very thin line, as opposed to here, where I could go with a fairly thick outline and then build fairly thickly into the areas that are shaded. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think when people look at your finished work, it's hard to imagine how anybody can just achieve that. But I think when you watch your process, you see what the decisions are that you're making. And, and, you know, I think, I think people are, are so intimidated to do portraiture because you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. particularly if you're drawing a person in front of you and you say, oh no, it just doesn't look like them. And I'm sitting there right in front of them. And it's so embarrassing. And I feel like I'm an awful yeah. artist and yeah. they're going to think I'm a poser yeah. and, and all those different <laughs> things. I mean, I don't, I don't think you should have that problem judging by the work that you do, but what, what, how, how can people deal with that? I, I have to say that, that that moment of, you know, when, when a drawing is really not going in the direction that you want and you know it's past redemption, it still happens to me. <laughs> it still does, you know, especially when, when you have the pressure of being in front of someone that maybe you know, which is even worse, um, and having to to translate that face that you see in front of you onto paper, that's a very stressful experience because you're, you're really, because if it were just up to you, you know, the person drawing, you could deal with, you know, whatever distortion and, and so forth and be happy with it or not. But when you know you're going to show this to somebody else, you know that the only thing that they're going to worry about is one thing, it's the resemblance. 
do they look good and do they look good too <laughs> right yeah yeah did, oh did you you know Sometimes did you do something about those wrinkles goal. right exactly. mm -hmm. no it's true i think um i think that adds that adds an unnecessary pressure that can can definitely be a hindrance when you start drawing um, and, and that's why I suggest to anybody who, who wants to get into portraiture and drawing people, don't draw people you know, don't draw famous people, draw people who are unknown, whose faces nobody knows and you don't really know, but at least that will give you an opportunity to, to practice drawing without worrying about resemblance, without worrying about, oh, did I just make them look too old? You know, because these things are just hurdles and you know that hurdles is definitely what we, tr we try to uh, to remove as much as we can. Right. I mean, that's why life drawing classes are great because you're paying the model so you can draw them however you want. But also drawing, yeah. you know, in a public place, drawing, which we don't get to do right now, but drawing um, people who are kind of not aware that you're drawing them is also good. But I think another thing to think about on top of all of this is this is a process and it's mm -hmm. not as much about whether or not the final drawing really looks like the person it's more about the process of enjoying drawing and if you're constantly Absolutely. obsessing about the likeness and the result mm -hmm. it make it gets in the way of you having fun but cross hatching is just it's just a lot of fun i mean it's just a really um i don't know i find it meditative you know you can just it's like it's doodly i mean well, tell, tell, tell me about your, because you're such an avid cross-hatcher, tell me about your approach to it and your feeling about it. For me, it is it is something that, first of all, um, and you will agree with this, I'm sure, it's kind of like watercolor. I remember one day you, you equated it to watercolor, and that was very true. You can't rush it. You really cannot rush it. You just have to layer, and then you come back and you layer again, and then you come back and you layer again. And... And this, this repetition, I think this is where I find the, the meditative aspect of, of cross-hatching, the fact that there is so much repetition in this, uh, in this process. And then you come back and you do it again. You know, it, it, I don't know, I, I can only think of the people who make candles. You know, you, you dip it and then you let it draw and then you dip it again and your candle grows. And it's just, you know, it's this thing where... Yeah, at the end you have a candle, and of course, at the end of, of a drawing you have something. But, but the process of that repetitive motion with your hand, that soothing. Um, you know, I don't do enough yoga to equate it to yoga, but I I am sure that there's something peaceful and repetitive about the motion of cross hatching that that brings peace. Yeah, and I I, abs I mean, if you think about it, you know, you're you you're a mother. You know, if you think about when you're you're a baby, you have a baby and it's like rocking and doing all those kinds of repetitive motions, right? right? right. They're very calming and, right. you know, so I think if you can, yeah, um, Cynthia points out, it's like knitting, you know, that you lay it down. Yes. By stitch. And I think another thing when you, when you, when you think about, even when you think about um, likeness, I've often done the thing where I'll do a drawing and I go, uh, it's really not good. I'm not. And then you keep working on the cross hatching, and slowly it starts to change and it becomes, right? That's it suddenly true. emerges. And you, you realize yeah. that what, the picture that you had in your head might actually be pretty different from the thing that you're drawing. And then that, that somehow the part of you that is building things up in cross hatching is actually seeing these details and building them up in such a way that becomes more accurate. And so then as those things start to come together, um, you go, oh, I hadn't even really seen it. I thought I was seeing it, and I was judging my drawing by this image Agreed. I had in my mind, right? But then suddenly it's like, no, actually, this is much truer. This is the truth that's coming through this. Yeah. You know what? I, 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 w I was going to say that um, it, it's very rare for me to have an image in my head of what the, something that have, I am going to crosshatch you know, is going to look like. I think what you're saying is very true. Crosshatching sort of reveals something as you do it and you just have have to let that revelation happen and again it's not something as you know that happens like this but it is this slow suddenly you know you said it emerges but that's exactly what it is suddenly you've got something that 
oh, that's interesting. I'm going to continue doing this and see what happens. And, and allowing yourself to do that, allowing yourself to trust that the drawing, it's going to reveal something to you that you had not planned. I mean, that's the stuff, right? That's, I know. That's, that's the adventure of it all, right? Because, yes. because, I, because I think particularly if you're going to draw from a photograph, right? So you sit down and there's a photograph. Mm -hmm. If your objective or if your experience is just to reproduce that photograph, well, what's the point? The photograph's already mm -hmm. there. But if, if you're going through this journey and this exploration and this discovery, as you say, that's the stuff. That's, the, that's really the, the point. And I think people coming along and looking at your photographs and at your drawings and say, oh my God, that looks like a photograph. They don't really understand what you got out of it, which isn't just that sense of accomplishment, because, mm -hmm. but it's more about that sense of discovery. I think that's really important to remember, you know? Um, so yeah. for those of you who are wondering about drawing, draw us, draw yourself, draw whatever. You and I are probably not going to draw today just because we're on Skype. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> it's too difficult to do. Um, so, uh, and we've seen you draw, of course, in that, in that beautiful video. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's um, feel, you are, so people want to know, are we supposed to be drawing? Or are you supposed to be paying attention to the conversation? Well, that's both. <laughs> you can do both. You can, you can, you know, it's always good to draw while people are talking. Um, so, yeah, so I think, um, what would you suggest to people who are cooped up at home right now and are wanting to, to practice some of the things that we're talking about? What, what, what kinds of assignments would you give them? Okay, so um, one of the things that I find is uh, one of the greatest things, you know, when you don't have the luxury of having someone in front of you that you can draw, and obviously in these days of social distancing, it, it may not be the case. For example, today I'm by myself. I would be hard-pressed to find someone uh, to draw right here at my, you know, in my apartment. But let's take, for instance, um, what you see right now on the screen. I'm looking at you, Danny. And I have, I don't want to say a perfect, but I have a pretty darn good example of something that I would want to cross hatch. Why? You've got a light source coming from the side. You've got a great deal of contrast, yes, on your face, which means that I have one side of your face, which offers a lot of possibilities for darkening. And the other side of the face, which is so flooded with light up to about, you know, the side of your nostril there. Uh, on this side, yes, on this side, um, that will really allow for a lot of, of playing of values, you know, like how much am I going to crosshatch to um, to translate this as opposed to the part that's uh, that's darker. So this kind of lighting, the kind that leaves quite a bit of contrast, is the best for crosshatching. And for any, I mean, for me, for any drawing, when... You know, when someone tells me, oh, can you draw me? And then they give me a photo of themselves and it's flooded with light and there's absolutely nothing to hang my hat on. You know what I mean? There's nothing in terms of, of, of contrast. That's really tough. So I would suggest if you were, for example, to use yourself as a, a, a source for your drawing, try to find a way to have natural light coming from one side or maybe from you know the top and 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 see if you can push the contrast even on your on your photo you know like on any smartphone you can do that you can push the contrast so that it's not just a blah uh, flood of light which really I, I don't find very interesting to draw right I, I think what's interesting and, and you can even think about not drawing an outline of the face, but just working on cross hatching the lights and dark space. I think like, if you look at my face yes. right now, what to me is interesting is like, look at the little like spots of light on the bottom of my nose yes. or here on the inside of my eye socket, you know, yes. it's when you discover yes. those things. And that's, that's really comes from just like looking yeah. at it and saying, you know, maybe I'll just start the drawing by just looking at this part of my nose and looking at all the different shapes that are in there and the different things, right? That's, Rather than saying, like, let me draw the whole head and put the eyes where they're supposed to be. I agree. Like you can, I mean, one of one of our teachers, um, Miguel Haran's freak hands, you know. Oh. Too, yeah. So, one, so he talks <laughs> about this technique that he uses in urban sketching, which I think you can use in drawing anything. 
which he yeah, calls you start the, with small the spiral, and, yes. right? The spiral, yes. right? So you yes. so you start with a small thing like this, and then you draw what's above it, what's yeah. beside it, below right. it, and you just keep and you build around, out. right? Yeah. So you could draw you right. could draw a person's face and just draw just the you know the eyes and the top of the nose, or you could just draw sure. you know just draw a little thing and then work yes. your way out. You might feel like you need yeah. to draw the whole face, but it might be much more evocative to leave the viewer's imagination to fill in the rest of the face, right? I agree, and and Danny, you know you you know what I do um, very well. I I rarely finish my drawings, and um, because for me, I I prefer learning than just finishing. I find that I I learn a lot more, not necessarily by finishing, but by just exploring what I wanted to explore. And in that respect, you know, when you take so when you isolate, let's say, a feature that you find where the light is really interesting, then do it once and maybe do it again and do it again on the same page and and find the, the different ways that you interpreted that. And then you compare and you're like, oh, my gosh, look at how I did it the first time. It's so amazing to be able to draw a face like this by decomposing it and maybe drawing the same feature several times on a page. I think it's. I think it, it can make for a really cool page. I think it can also oh, yeah. take the pressure off any one of the drawings, right? So often, if you, if you did like one big perfect head, you'd be worried. Mm -hmm. but, but it almost becomes mm -hmm. like um, like a science, a study, you know, right? Yes, a study. yes, exactly. So you might look mm -hmm. at it from different angles. You might look at just different. Mm -hmm. You might represent it in different ways. You could do a contour drawing. You could do cross hatching. So lots of different ways of in, in sort of adding or exploring. And, and again, think of it as exploring. Think of it, you know, as an opportunity to um, learn things, observe things, observe the light, observe the texture of the skin, all those kinds of things. And also this meditative aspect of cross-hatching. I was going to say yes. one of my favorite artists, I, I think you like him too, is Robert Crumb. Robert Crumb is just the master of, of cross-hatching. Yes. And, and there's yes. a really great movie, which if you have some downtime, go and look for. It's called Crumb, and it's about... It's a documentary about him. I've heard and, of it, yes. Oh, it's so, so good. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's definitely weird, so prepare yourself. He's he's an odd fellow. But, yeah. um, but he, uh, he talks in that documentary about, he says, I think that drawing is just an excuse to do cross-hatching. Like, the cross-hatching mm. is so great, and that's, you know, yes. the feeling of it is so great yes. that, oh, yeah, I'm do, I'll, I'll draw this person, but really I want to just draw yes. lots of little lines and cross hack them, go over and over them. So, yes. so think of it that way. It's just a fun kind of, uh, I mean, I, I think it is, it's like uh, doodling. It's like doing a cross. Think of drawing as a process rather than a result. The less likely your inner critic is going to be there destroying what you're doing. You know, and, I agree. You know, we, we had a conversation with Kusha uh, back in, in June, uh, online like this, Danny, about about the um, the pressure that the final product puts on us. I think that if you open your sketchbook, and I have one uh, right here in front of me, this is oh, one good. of my moleskins. Oh, um, show it to us. If I you, I could, let me see if I can get rid of me. I'm going to get rid of me so you can just show it full screen. Oh, okay? sure. There you are. Okay, so here's a perfect example of the kind of stuff that I do in my sketchbook. First of all, did you notice that I don't complete pages, so I leave a lot of things unfinished. But the reason why I'm showing you this is because my sketchbook is Wait, hold not it up again. really... hold it up again in the center because mm -hmm. you didn't quite see it. Um, like this? Of... Uh, there you go, perfect. It's... Yeah? That's actually very weird because it looks like they're your eyes with the top of your head. But... <laughs> Yes. But that, I mean, that's that is so, amazing. And is that is that just line? Yeah, that's just line. This is done with a pigma, you know, a fairly thin one. But the reason grays, why I'm talking gray, about this, yeah, yeah. The gray, the gray looks almost you... on camera. The gray almost looks like um, ink, brush ink, or something like that, like tone. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, great. Now yeah. it's all little lines. But the reason why I say this is because my sketchbooks are not really display worthy. I really don't think they are They're far from it. Um, let me show you something that we did recently when we were in Washington Square back on November 2nd, I believe. Right. Look, this is a 
um, a blind contour of the uh, arch on Washington Square. So um, I would not display this anywhere, but I think this is a truly important part of my process is that I do not consider my sketchbook as something to be later displayed, but more for my learning um, you know, process. Here's a bunch of chickens that I was looking at. You know, some of them I've delved into a little bit with cross hatching afterwards, mm -hmm. but most of them were very quickly done. And I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of this page. I actually, I actually I, I don't really say, like I, it. I love that page. I love, I love you the do? contrast of the big contour drawings and then the smaller, deeper. Th I think it's mm. great. I, th I do. You're not a good quality. You're not a good. Uh, uh, judge of Critic. your work i know I, I okay i get it no you're right um <laughs> of course i have things that are more finished like my my daughter's shoe mm. like this but again if you notice there is no um like i know people danny who have gorgeous sketchbooks like you open them from a to z each page is amazing to look at right it's like oh my gosh me i have screw ups look at this because I started one way. I was like, yeah, no, you know. That's great. But, I, and I think that's, that's important to remember that you have to allow yourself to make average pages sometimes. The ones that are going to teach you stuff, um, you know, like this one, I didn't go too far with it. I just kind of dropped it. It was on the counter at somebody's house. Right. Um, and yeah, I think... It, I'm trying to get away from the performance aspect, you know, like, and just, um, and just practice. No, I think, I, I mean, I think that you, you don't see yourself as a sketchbook artist. Like I take someone like Tommy Kane, yeah. you know, his, right. every page I, of his book is perfect. And, you know, he's, yes. he's creating a final thing. You're using yes. your drawings as, as exercises and, um, not exercises, but I think you're not seeing the book itself as a final artwork. No, I do not. So you're absolutely right. I don't see the book itself. In fact, this is one of probably four or five that I have going at the same time. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, I understand that. I mean, for me, for a long time, my sketchbook was my journal. You know, it was my, yeah. it was a record right. of my life. So I was recording right. things and writing things. Yours is a different mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, well, listen, this has been really fun. It's been really great to talk to you. If you'd like, if you guys would like to see more of France's work, you know, you should follow her on Instagram. Um, wagonized, right? It's wa okay. That's me. Let me just put it it's up. It's like a wagon. Me. Oh my gosh. I still have my license plate from my, uh, my Volvo wagon. Right. <laughs> 93 wagon was my license plate. Um, but yeah, wagonized. So you, so you, and you were wagonized in part because you also love to draw cars. That's another thing that you, yeah. you've always been doing. I do. About. So, yeah. so um, if you want to see more of Frances' work, as I said, follow her on Instagram. Look at her amazing book, Sketch, which I'm sure you can have <laughs> delivered to you by Amazon. Um, yes. And um, she's also on Sketchy, which is a great resource mm -hmm. for drawing people that you should definitely check out. And um, what else? Oh, and of course, people drawing people, our class. And so yes. So people drawing people, I just think it's one of the best classes we've ever made. And I think people have gotten so much out of it because you will really learn to draw people and you will learn to draw it in lots of different styles. You have Felix Scheinberger and, or, or Carlos Aponte, oh, yeah. whose styles are radically different from France's. Or you have Vin Ganapati, yeah. whose style is a bit closer to France. And then you yeah. have Kosha, you have me. You have mm -hmm. um, Jason Doss, just lots of different True, people. Yes. And so in any given situation, you will see a range of different ways of approaching this explained in detail. So anyway, I'm not doing an ad, but I just, I love this course. I love to talk about it. So, <laughs> um, so listen, thank you all for, um, for joining me today and joining France. Uh, we are going to be, we're not going to be doing this on the weekend because it's the weekend, but also because tomorrow we're doing this um, fountain workshop. 
And we'll also be announcing a new workshop next week that you can find out about, and I'll talk about that some more on Monday. But uh, spend the weekend doing some drawing, draw some people, and if you do, share it. Hold on a second. I, and I have a URL somewhere. Let me just go to a different scene one second. Yes, here. It's uh, S- hashbook, hashtag uh, SDS <laughs> Drawing Party. And also, remember to subscribe to this channel and to like the, like our Facebook page. If you do, then you'll automatically know when we get new um you know, when we, when we do the next installment. I know sometimes it's a little bit difficult for people to find this out, where we exactly we are, but also Morgan is trying to make that clearer. And and also share this with friends. Bring other people in to draw with you, um, whether it's virtually, you know, you could do a oh, FaceTime yeah. do a FaceTime or a Skype session with them. And, uh, you know, you could draw each other, right? You could, France and I could be drawing each other. It's a great, fun thing to do. Um, but... Get them to join us on this program so we can uh, all draw together and make the world a calmer, beautiful, more beautiful place um, until we have the chance to meet in person again, do some urban sketching. That will happen soon, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, France. It was really nice. Thank really you, fun. Danny. Okay.